Uh, so, by the way, that, that last session by Jesse was awesome. Um, I think of the 15 hacks that he listed, I can count off 14 that I screwed up in the last two years. Um, so it's good to, good to see and remind myself that I've got uh, some work to cut out, cut out for me. And, and that's what I love about this conference. I've been here for, I think this is my fourth year in a row, um, and I'm always learning things. Um, in, in this case, obviously, all these hacks and where I've been screwing up for the last couple of years. Um, as Steve mentioned, I had a startup. Uh, last year, I was up here on stage kind of sharing some of the lessons I learned from my startup and how to use the cloud and some of the operational tools. Um, and as I've been integrating that startup into the company I work for now, Newstar, uh, I've continued to learn a lot, and I wanted to share some of those things as well. Um, uh, Jesse did mention uh, creating champions, and one of the things he says, get executive sponsors. If any of you were in uh, my panel uh, with a few other uh, uh, executives from other companies, you would have learned from Josh uh, Bixby that executives have small brains. Um, so that's something else that, uh, that you can take away from this. So when you're getting executive sponsorship, as Jesse recommends, I think you just talk fast and wave your hands, and that might work. Um, one of the other things I learned, though, was that uh, we, we, I'm here to talk about real user monitoring, but I've also heard Steve just said real user metrics, and I've heard other folks that I greatly respect here talk about real user measurement. And so one of the very first things I'm doing is I'm changing the title of my, uh, my, my deck here. Um, and so I, I did sneaker net and ran over there and updated my deck. Um, and, and, and I think that's actually a more appropriate title uh, for, for the things that are going on with uh, nav timings and some other stuff I'll, I want to talk about. Um, so change the deck. Um, there are basically three things in the DevOps culture that I believe you need to be you know, always keeping an eye on. Performance, availability, and functionality. Um, those are the, the core things your users care about. Performance, is it fast, is it showing up? Is, are, is my database running well? Is, it, is the user experiencing the site quickly? Of course, all that matters. Availability, is it simply accessible? And of course, functionality, can I go and, and play my game of words with friends or transfer money from my checking to savings account? You've gotta track all three of those. And there are a variety of tools to help you do that. And what I want to do here is kind of walk through briefly some of the traditional tools that, that we all use in this room to try to help measure, monitor, and trend these, uh, these types of activities. So the traditional one is synthetic HTTP monitoring, just simply making a GET request or making a POST request out to some URL from one or more locations around the world and making sure it returns back a response code and a, and a piece of text maybe in the body. Um, and I would, I would say if I'm grading these things that it's not really even applicable for functionality in any meaningful way. It does a really good job for availability. Um, if anybody uses uh, tools like, say, Pingdom, um, you know, Pingdom is pretty good at telling you when your site is not online. Um, and it's a scary little thing to get in your inbox, but it's, it's good. Um, I would say it's marginal at best, though, uh, not just that product, but the synthetic monitoring uh, with just pure HTTP requests for trending and tracking performance since you're just getting a single URL and we know so, so much is built into the browser. So moving on, another tool, you know, you saw functionality was really not even graded. So in order to cover that, a lot of people focus on continuous integration, automated testing. Um, and, uh, and I'd say that if you've, you've got a good practice with your automated tests and continuous integration, uh, you can give yourself an A grade if you're, if you're doing that. Uh, I was really happy to see uh, Marcel's lightning demo talking about how you can pull in uh, why slow tests into your J unit test suite and be tracking that kind of stuff within your functional tests. And so that you're sort of blending performance and, and uh, functionality. Um, and just as a little side note, uh, if you're a user of Selenium, which is a project I contribute to, use Jenkins, previously known as Hudson, and you combine that with the cloud, you can do some really badass functional testing. And if you're not doing that, it might be something to look into. Uh, and tomorrow at WebPerf Days, I'm going to be sharing some of my tips for how to capture performance data out of your traditional functional tests. So if you're coming to that, uh, please check it out. Um, but there's still performance. You know, I've got a you know, pretty good way to solve per, uh, functionality, pretty good way to solve availability, but there's still performance. And I really see performance as, as traditionally being viewed as two, two halves. Uh, external performance using the synthetic monitoring tools and internal performance using uh, network monitoring tools, APM products, things like that. Um, so let's look at some of the APM stuff. I'd say, you know, from an availability standpoint, since APM and, and other network monitoring tools is a really passive technology, I would say it's not very good at availability, so I just leave that blank. 
And for performance, it's really good for that internal stuff. My, this database query is slow, or this web service is causing a problem. But it's still not telling you what your end user is doing. It's not that external component. It's pretty good for functionality, too. It's telling you all about the errors that might be happening, how many 500 errors you're throwing or stack traces you're kicking off. Um, and so it can help you understand when functionality is impaired. Um, but it's not perfect. So if we kind of add all this stuff up into a little scorecard, what I see is, is kind of, you know, we've got still that good functionality, good availability. We can track that. But we're still not seeing the complete picture for performance. And so we've got to keep going further. And that's where companies like uh, mine, Newstar, and other companies have come and over the previous years have said, you've got to be doing synthetic monitoring with real browsers. That's how to do it. And they can do it because it's realistic. All over the world, there's hundreds of locations where we've got servers set up and we're pinging your site just from where your real users are. It's very realistic, sort of. And that's kind of the rub. Um, it's not very realistic. It's a bunch of robots. And these robots are not your real users. Um, got a few big Lebowski fans out there. Um, and that's the problem. Uh, I've heard a couple other sessions already reference it. These people are on, or these robots are on high speed connections. They're usually on a fixed browser version. They don't have some crazy toolbar installed that totally jacks up your, your computer. Um, they're not on a four, you know, 4G connection. They're not by their microwave. Um, and the dude, he's doing all of that stuff. Um, and, and so it's not the same experience. It's a great baseline, but it's not the same. And so I would argue that those tools, although they've declared themselves as being an A score on performance, are actually probably maybe more to a B, similar to APM. They're, they're a good picture, but not the complete picture. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in the same position. We still are kind of missing a clear view of, of performance. So looking back at this, this pie chart, um, it, you know, we're seeing internal, external, what's missing? And of course, I think the uh, theme of the, the conference this year, I've noticed, is a lot of talk about real user measurement. And so I would argue that this is what it should look like more. And I don't know exactly what the right ratio is, whether it's, you know, 50, 25, 25, or 33, 33, you know. I, I don't really know how you should split it up. I think that kind of depends on your business and your, um, your, your, your boss, your users, all of that. Uh, but what I do know is that your boss and your users probably think it should look like that, that all that matters is the external performance as perceived by real users. And, and so that does mean it needs some attention, I'd say a great deal of attention, and it hasn't been getting much. So I've been really happy to see so much attention on RUM this year. And that's, that's partly due to the fact that so many new innovations have come out in these browsers in the last year with the web timing spec. Um, and so there are two big things that I want to just remind folks to be thinking about uh, as, they're, as they're looking at how they can get real measurements from their end users. Window.performance is one of the ways you can get into your, your real your, uh, web timing spec. And so if you're not familiar with that, just pop open the console on your browser and type window.performance and start exploring that object and see what kind of data is in there in, the, in any page you're visiting, because odds are there's, there's some good data in there. But the other one that's not really talked about at all is this really old school thing. I think it's been around since like IE 5.5, you know, years and years old, is, is window.onerror. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of crashes and breakages inside of the browser or inside of the client, if it's a smartphone, um, that are not really being captured and reported back to, to you to help you understand how things are breaking down. And I would argue that it's not just performance timing that you want to capture from your real users, but it's some of the functionality when things are going bad and breaking. And you should be analyzing that kind of data, too. Um, so, you know, key message here you've been hearing from a lot of people talking about RUM is that the crowd is the truth. And, and there's, a lot, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, it's not the complete picture. I think you need all of those different tools that I was kind of lining out. But the information that can come from the crowd, all the signals that they can emit through na uh, the nav timings, through um, uh, error capturing and er exception reporting is, is very meaningful data that, for the most part, is still getting dropped on the floor. Um, I spent about, I don't know, three or four hours, I uh, had like golf on on the background on Sunday, and, uh, and went and visited every single 
one of the 60 uh, vendors that are here at this conference. And these are all leading edge companies, you know, very impressive companies in this space. And what I found is that only one, and so uh, uh, tip of the hat to, to Dropbox, uh, is capturing JavaScript errors. And so I went and forced a fake JavaScript error, and I noticed they send those back to a beacon. None of the other sites did that. There might be a few that, uh, that sample it or do it in some other way that I didn't notice, but very few websites did that. Uh, wag of the finger to uh, Eloqua. I'm sorry for calling them out by name, but their tag actually sets the window.onerror to a function that says return true, uh, which is kind of a bummer. Um, so watch out for that. Um, but uh, from a RUM standpoint, only six of the vendors actually had any sort of dedicated RUM type of offering that was installed. But thanks to Google and the things that they've done over the last year, just about this time last year, rolled out RUM measurements in Google Analytics, 83% of the companies are now capturing real user monitoring data. So you may be out there as well, and you don't even know that you're capturing it, but you are. And I'd recommend you start looking at it. Um, the JavaScript errors, I really want to <laughs> highlight the importance of this. This is actually uh, our own application. We have a, a commercial uh, monitoring and load testing product, and it looked like this last week for about 45 minutes uh, without the oops page. It was just a big blank screen, and that was because we screwed up something on our CDN, and it was causing a JavaScript error. And we weren't, we're one of those guilty people, too, where Dropbox is, uh, is the only one I saw. Newstar was not feeding that data back out somewhere and sh lighting up the light, you know, the alarm saying, there's a crap ton of JavaScript errors happening on your page. And so we didn't see this right away. And I would, I, I would say that's something we need to go and do. Um, so I'm airing the dirty laundry out there. But my guess is that anybody out here who's got a rich JavaScript application has probably had something like this happen and you didn't know it for a little while. So it's a, a important information to try to capture. From a performance standpoint, like I said, Google Analytics is a great way to go. Uh, they've got a lot of that real user uh, uh, metrics that they're capturing. There's a, there are also, of course, dedicated tools, just so you can kind of get an idea of what's out there. This is some of the stuff that we're doing at Newstar. Um, you can see app deck scores along the bottom, average response times. You can drill in and get a little more detail. You can slice and dice things by domain and path and autonomous system and uh, connection speed and region, filter things out and really get a good picture of where your users are, are, are suffering. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do, pretty much just raise awareness on these two additional techniques that are coming that are signals from your end users. So client error capture is not exactly the end all be all to functionality. You still need to be investing, I think, in a continuous integration tool, especially because it's, it's able to um, run a wide range of tests that you're building for your application, but it's a great way to know when functionality isn't there, when things are breaking. And so whether it's a mobile app, there are a few great solutions out there already for capturing crashes on mobile apps and reporting them back, or whether it's just a little piece of code you've written that just captures all the on-air uh, callbacks and buffers them up and sends them out, that's some good information that you should start capturing to augment these tools. And of course, the other one is the, the real user measurement, the nav timings. Um, I think it gives you a great picture of performance. It's not the only picture, but it gives you probably the one that your boss and your users care about the most. Um, so at the end of the day, if you combine all these different tools together, and, and not, don't look at any single one, because each individual tool has, has a whole, but if you combine them all together, you can see you can get a very good measurement of the thing that matters most to anyone who's in DevOps, which is performance, availability, and functionality. So I hope that gives you a little something to think, of, think about and chew on. Again, I'm from Newstar. We provide some of these types of tools, certainly not all of them. Uh, we do synthetic monitoring using Selenium. Um, which I'm really happy there's a fellow here in the audience named David Burns who's helping turn Selenium into a W3C spec, and he's working with Mozilla and Opera and uh, Google, and so that's great. Um, and, uh, and we use Selenium for our, our tools, and we provide a few other products, load testing, and of course now real user monitoring. So that's kind of what, what the application looks like, and if you want to see it, uh, please stop by. The beta is available for everybody to try out. We'd be happy to give you a demo. Thanks so much.